These are in listen-only mode. Good morning. Welcome to Kaufman Fast Track's author series. In fact, the first author series for 2015. We're thrilled that you uh, choose to join us for this. And we are so excited about our, our guest speaker, our guest author this month. Um, the author, as you can see on your screen, is Pete Worrell. Um, we are so pleased to welcome you, Pete. Thank you so much for coming. Um, his book is, is called Enterprise Value, How the Best Owners Managers Build Their Fortune, Capture Their Company's Gains, and Create Their Legacy. This is a fabulous book, and we were so thrilled when we were able to connect with Pete, and we are very much so looking forward to the webcast. So Pete, welcome, and thank you for uh, helping us kick off our new year in style. Thank you. It's great to be here with you. And uh, I'm looking forward to spending the next uh, hour or so together. Uh, my plan is to uh, spend uh, maybe 40 or 45 minutes uh, with a little bit of a presentation mode. And then if it works, uh, we'd have some plenty of time left for questions and answers. So uh, I guess um, maybe the folks at uh, Cop and Fast Track, maybe Kim or Michelle will be handling the questions. I will. I'll be, I'll be tracking the questions throughout. So. For the participants, if you have questions, feel free to key them in, and I will uh, I will track them, and then we will um, have some Q and A time available, as Pete says, at the end of the webcast. Great. Well, Michelle, shall I just wade in? Yes. No. Please, please do. Great. So um, it's really fun to be here. This is sort of the most fun I have professionally is sharing uh, my thoughts and insights with. Uh, entrepreneur owner managers and nascent entrepreneurs and expert advisors to entrepreneurs and uh, I've enjoyed uh, spending 25 plus years in hundreds of transactions and thousands of entrepreneurs and uh, had a lot of uh, scar tissue built from that so some of the fun I have is to be able to freely share those thoughts and insights with you today the concepts we'll talk about are lifted in effect from my book called Enterprise Value published last year by McGraw-Hill the book um, really was written for entrepreneur owner managers and expert advisors because many many times in the course of my career I had entrepreneurs and advisors say to me ah oh, Pete gee if I'd only known then what I know now and of course what I found was actually they could know then what they learn now the kinds of things we're talking about with them are knowable in advance they're very systematic it's hard work, but they could be very well prepared to think about how to build and capture value in their uh, private businesses. So this is a, our own original IP. You won't see it anywhere else. I'm going to share it with anyone who would like it after this webcast. And I'll just urge you to sort of buckle up here and uh, put your seatbelts on because uh, we're going to move rapidly, and I, I hope you'll enjoy it. What we're going to cover very quickly are the distinct characteristics of entrepreneur owner managers. We're then going to talk about the private transaction market, what I call the seller beware market. We'll just briefly touch on the dis different kinds of investors. And then we're going to spend some time on this question, which I ask a little bit tongue in cheek. If you want to have a capital gain someday, what are the six things you can do right now? So it's really essential in terms of foundational theory that knowing how to build enterprise value is all good for, for businesses. You don't have to be interested in wanting to sell your company someday to want to build enterprise value, right? I mean, from increased enterprise value, all good things come. More enterprise value is better than less enterprise value. So the theory here is with, with all of us on the webinar today is that we're all interested in sort of optimizing and doing that. If you are an entrepreneur or a manager listening to this, and you do want to speak with an entrepreneur who's been through it, then sometime in the future you can contact me and I'll put you directly in touch with entrepreneurs who've been through it so you can ask them uh, the questions that you might have. I want to thank Michelle and Kim and Kaufman Fast Track, part of the Kaufman Foundation effort. Uh, Michelle uh, got a copy of Enterprise Value, read it, and acted really quickly to put this uh, together. Kim, is, uh, her approach and her effort has been invaluable. This is a very quick uh, slide on myself. You can see that um, my background and my uh, experience is 100% uh, of the time with entrepreneur owner managers. 
in our practice, that's our only kind of client. In addition, I have an advanced degree in positive psychology. So what we'll find here this morning is we're going to talk an awful lot about hard finance topics, but we're also going to talk about the psychological aspects of decision making. Enterprise value uh, is really a, a series of chapters that's um, illuminated by real life stories that are told uh, because of the experiences we've had with uh, these entrepreneur owner managers. Why do we feel called to dedicate our lives to entrepreneurs? Very simply, I believe that entrepreneur owner managers are the most powerful pro-social and pro-economic force on the planet. Why do I say that? Can you see these names, these 12 names on the left side of the slide? Can you imagine why I put down these names in this order? Let's see. Sure, they're all successful entrepreneur owner managers, but in this order, they represent the 12 largest private charitable foundations in North America. That's why I say that entrepreneur owner managers are some of the most powerful pro-social forces on the planet. Because as entrepreneurs create wealth and then capture that wealth in a form of a capital gain, it's passed on to the rest of us, either in an economic way or in a not-for-profit social sector way. It's been fun uh, having this book and talking with entrepreneurs about this book. Uh, just the other day, I was with a prospective client, a woman who's a CEO of a very successful manufacturing business. She walked in and she had the book under her um, arm. I've never met her before. She kind of slapped the book down on the table in front of me and said, I read your book. And her name's Deb. I said, oh, Deb, you did? She said, yes. I'm in here. And I said, well, yeah, you are, because I, I wrote the book for people like you. She said, no, I'm in here. Page 86, Peter, that's me. So what I find is that um, entrepreneur owner managers and their advisors really relate to these stories. You might find that some of them are very funny or entertaining, but I think you might find that some of them are very, um, very moving as well. A very quick look at Bigelow. Bigelow has been my professional home since 1980. We're an M&A advisory firm where our only clients are entrepreneur owner managers. You'll see if you'd like to go on our website, we have a ton of intellectual property and original research that we share openly with anyone who would like it. Why do we do it? We have research with the University of Pennsylvania on the character strengths of entrepreneurs. We have research with the team from the Kennedy School at Harvard on the risk tolerance of entrepreneurs. We have our book. The reason why we do it is on the left side of the page. We're trying to be the best M&A advisory firm in the world on this little tiny niche. That's what we aspire to be. So um, we spend a lot of time trying to think about who those particular clients are. What's the world that we live in? The framing here is that, uh, in my view, uh, we have two different economies in the developed world. We have the bureaucratic economy, which was born of the Industrial Revolution and is built on the genius of division of labor. The compensation in that economy usually is selling time by the unit, the day, the hour, the year. The people who operate in that economy are frequently agents, employees. They are probably the dominant force in our world economy by far. If I were going to take a shot just, uh, from the hip, I'd say that 80% uh, of our uh, world economy is in the bureaucratic side. But there's great tension today. Uh, that we also have a very um, large, growing, I would argue flourishing, entrepreneurial economy. The productivity there is powered by 7 by 24 global, instant, almost free communication. The compensation there is, first, you create value for your customer. Then, you negotiate for a slice of that value. So quite risky, right? that first you have to bring value, and only after you bring value do you earn potentially a slice of it. But interestingly, unlike the compensation in the bureaucratic economy, the economic reward is potentially uncapped. The people in that economy frequently are principals. What do I mean by that? They have their skin in the game. 
So in the bureaucratic side where most of the actors behave as agents or employees, in the entrepreneurial economy, they act as principals. The reason that's important will become apparent in a couple more slides, but if you're a principal acting on your own account, you are subject to some psychological biases, some cognitive biases that affect how you make decisions. If you know about them in advance, like we're going to talk about today, then you can take them into account. In the bureaucratic economy, we say it flourishes in periods of change. I think you probably get that compared to the bureaucratic, sorry, that's the uh, entrepreneurial economy, compared to the bureaucratic economy, which flourishes in period of stasis. I've made all these comments on average and in the aggregate so that we can learn from looking at them together. You can probably think to yourself about exceptions. But I think this is a good way just to think about our world, 80-20. So we're at this place that we live. Where we say we live is the intersection of really hard finance and where hard finance encounters the complexity of humans. So if we study hard finance, if we study modern portfolio theory or mean variance optimization or whatever the kinds of theories that we discuss in hard finance, we need to put over the top of that the fact that the people who are making decisions based on that are very frail humans who frequently are, if not governed, then affected by their emotions. We can look at all the hard data we want, right? But if we don't know what the distinct characteristics are of entrepreneur owner managers, then we maybe don't have as much of an opportunity to understand why they make decisions in the way they make decisions. So in the book, Enterprise Value, you'll find much more detail on this and all of the information I'm giving you. But we actually did uh, some very significant original research to determine what are the distinct characteristics of entrepreneur owner managers. Who are these animals that we call entrepreneurs anyway? Why do they make decisions the way they do? Why do they make decisions sometimes that don't even seem in their best interest? We used a tool called the VIA uh, Survey of Character Strengths. That stands for Values in Action, which is a 24 uh, variable survey taken by over 1.2 million people in the general population online. We then compared the general population to the several hundred people that we asked to take it who were seasoned, successful entrepreneurs. You can look at the full study if you'd like to know more about what our methodology is. But the result of the method methodology is that the five top character strengths of seasoned successful entrepreneurs are authenticity, leadership, fairness, gratitude, and zest in that order. Why is that important? Well, if you don't understand that for seasoned successful entrepreneurs, the number one characteristic is authenticity, and you gloss over or you're not transparent or candid, you may find you're not as effective with those people as you would otherwise be. If you don't understand, for example, that entrepreneurs are high in zest. In fact, there are two standard deviations higher in zest than the general population. But it may be more difficult to understand the power of their inspiration of attracting other talent. If you do understand these character strengths, and my argument is that you will understand why they make decisions the way they make them. And if you're an entrepreneur owner manager, you can substitute why they for why I may make decisions the way that you do. If you look at the study and you'd like to take this test yourself, you can go online and take it. It's free and the results are immediate. We think about the distinct characteristics of, of entrepreneur owner managers also in a temporal way. We add time onto it. We call this the life arc of an entrepreneur owner manager. It gives us a little bit of a road map to look at systematically how to approach kind of what's coming next. Yesterday afternoon, I was with a prospective client uh, in a distribution business uh, who is the CEO, owner-manager of a very significant, valuable business. He was there with 
another family member. And I was using, I just put up the slide for a second, uh, knowing I was going to give this uh, webinar today. I put up the slide for a second to illustrate something I was talking about with him. And he looked at me and said, Peter, were you in the meeting that we had yesterday with our management team? What we find is that entrepreneur owner managers look at the slide down on the bottom left. They start out with no assets, no reputation, and they're willing to leverage themselves with bank debt, sometimes with other people's equity. The value of the enterprise grows, and over time they maybe develop a unique team. They hire a CEO. And very frequently what we find is that the enterprise value, if we look at it, frequently exceeds their expectations of what they ever dreamed the business was going to be worth. At some point there, they become what we call risk averse. Risk aversion is something that affects all of us as investors. And at sooner or later, uh, we start to think about how are we going to protect what we have rather than trying to optimize the future of it uh, going forward. We value and appreciate just how hard it is to go to work every day and to try to work with the management team, make the sales, collect the receivables, move the inventory and do it day after day to build an organization which has high enterprise value and has sustainability beyond the person individual. You see we have a section there called T, that would be the transaction, and after the transaction we uh, highlight four stages that entrepreneur owner managers frequently go through. We call them realization, meaning realization of the capital gain, hibernation, which is a stage they go through after realization, experimentation and reinvention. Look, the U.S., the feds say that 50% of all businesses don't make it past the five-year mark. So these are really the survivors, the ones who really make it to this point and, and do great. It sounds like someone on the webinar may have their um, microphone on. Uh, Pete, this is Michelle. I, I but I'm just going to continue. Please mute the lines. I'm now going to move to slide 10. And you remember I talked a few slides ago about the differences between principal and agent. So I'd ask you just to think with me for a second about the differences between being a principal, in other words, having your skin in the game, and being an agent, in other words, not having your skin in the game. As a principal, you're subject to cognitive decision-making biases. Agents, luckily, should not be. They should be what I'll call coldly objective. So an example might be an entrepreneur and their lawyer. The entrepreneur, subject to cognitive decision-making biases, the lawyer, an agent for the entrepreneur, shouldn't be. Here are four of the most common uh, decision-making biases that we see with entrepreneur owner managers. The most important takeaway I want to take, have you take from this slide, and again, this is another slide that um, we go into decision-making biases in great detail in our book, Enterprise Value. The most important takeaway is that we're all, as principals, subject to these kinds of biases. Loss aversion is just one. So loss aversion is where, when an enterprise grows to a certain size, suddenly we become more concerned about preserving the value than we are willing to risk something to increase the value. In fact, we turn out to be risk-seeking to preserve the value. It's kind of upside down from where we became an entrepreneur. And I would urge that if the business that you're in needs more risk, it needs something more capital, uh, more sales, more whatever, then you're willing to give. That's a good time to think about whether or not you ought to continue to be the owner of that business. Endowment effect is a cognitive bias that has been illustrated thousands of times in laboratories and in real life. I'll give you a real-life example. I was uh, negotiating a transaction on behalf of a client, and I called them one afternoon, a Sunday afternoon, and I remember it very clearly because it was Super Bowl Sunday. I'm not a sports fan, so I didn't realize that. And he told me, Peter, you're the only person I would have taken a call from this afternoon. And I explained to him that if we had uh, 
three offers in for his business that we were representing to be recapitalized. And the offers were in the $60 million, $60 million range. And the best offer was near 70 and that I was uh, urging that he um, think about um, moving forward that offer on that Monday morning. He said to me, well, that, that offer is just too low. The price, it's got to be at least $77 million. And I said, oh, okay, well, we have uh, one offer in the high 50s. We have one in the low 60s. We have a number of them be below the 50s. So I'm feeling like the offer in towards 70 is a pretty good one. That's my logic. What's your logic? He said, I don't know. I just think it can't be a, a dollar less than 77. So I asked him, Chris, if you had $77 million and you were looking at this business, would you pay $77 million in cash for this business? He said to me, I think that's an unfair question. So I just tell you with uh, a great deal of affection about my friend Chris, that's called endowment effect, which is by mere ownership of an asset seems to endow it in your mind with higher value than it would actually have. If you find yourself looking at an asset, your business or any other asset, and if your willingness to sell it means that you would do it at a higher price than your willingness to buy it, you're, you're suffering a endowment effect. Let me go to the next section. The next section, I'm being a little provocative with you here, I call seller beware, the private transaction market. So the private transaction market is the market in which ownership changes of private companies take place, right? And the reason we have this slide is to show you that while all of us who went to trade schools, whether it was uh, business school, law school, medical school, whatever it is, you're sort of taught and you think about public cases and you talk about the public market. You pick up the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times and you see things about the public market. All of our media and our popular culture focuses on the public market, but I ask you why? Because you see in America today, there's only 5,800 public companies, and there are almost 6 million private companies. The total value of the public companies is about 35 trillion. The total value of private companies is much larger than that. The number of employment in public companies is about 35 million. The employment in private companies is closer to 100 million. So we have this curious thing that we think about, are taught about, and talk about the public market as if it's the market, but actually the private transaction market is much larger, and as I'll show you, much more complex. Some qualitative characteristics of these two markets are that the public market, which was really the, the characteristics are formed by the Securities Act of 1933 and 34 is designed to be very transparent, right? It's very, very regulated. You notice that if you have a public company stock and you want to trade it, you must go through a broker-dealer. You can't sell it from person to person. When can you sell it? Well, you have to sell it on an exchange, and the exchange are open at certain hours. And the regulations are there to protect the buyer. So it's what I call a buyer beware market. We all understand that market. But that's not the market that private company ownership transactions take place in. The private company transaction market is a completely unregulated market, very free form. There's no stock exchange. There's no regulatory requirements about disclosure. There are no exchanges. And very interestingly, most of the people who go into that market, like you, a successful entrepreneur, owner, manager, go into the market once in their life for the largest single financial transaction of their lives. In that market, the buyers, the investors, are all more experienced and more sophisticated in the market than the sellers are. That's why we call it a seller beware market. It's not the wild, wild west, but it's pretty darn close. What are some other characteristics of the private transaction market? Well, we come back to our concept of principal versus agent again. The entrepreneur owner manager over there on the left, all by him or herself, goes into the market as a principal. Skin in the game. Everything to win, everything to lose. Filled with cognitive biases about how to make decisions. The investors, on the other hand, are a people who usually who are agents. It's not their money they're investing. They're investing for others. 
And interestingly, the agents have a lot more experience than the entrepreneur owner managers have. You may go in the market once, or a few entrepreneurs, serial entrepreneurs, go in more than once, but the investors, both private equity investors and strategic investors, are in that market every day, right? They're making investment after investment after investment. That's the business that they're in. They also have an asymmetry of information. They have an ability to glean lots of information, all the comparables they look at, all of the other companies they look at and they, go, and they learn from. Well, you as the entrepreneur owner manager in this market really not having access to any of that. So we have these investors who are really experienced, have lots of information, you know, they have elite educations, they're uh, in a pack, and we have a group of entrepreneurs who really are inexperienced in this market, they're emotional, they're anxious, they're fearful, their skin is in the game, and they're going to make the one time, they're going to make the largest single transaction of their lives. So the market is really, really not level, is it? It's a seller beware market, and the investors have a big, big advantage. How do you level the playing field? Very simple. You have to create a market. What I'm showing you here is some of our own cooking. We don't show it to everyone. What this is on the, on the bar chart at the top is uh, engagement A. This is an actual engagement where an entrepreneur-owned business was either sold or recapitalized. What do I see? when I look at this bar chart? Well, what I see are three different kinds of investors. The blue boxes are private equity firms. The red triangles are strategic investors. In other words, people who have a synergistic reason for being in the business. The yellow are private equity platforms, a form of a private equity company. What else do I see when I look at this bar? Well, I see there were 19 offers. And what else do I see? Wow, a strategic investor is at the top. In fact, if you just do a little arithmetic with me here and you say that the median offer was $100 million, then it would say that a strategic thought this business was worth $167 million. Do you see what I'm saying there? It says 67% over the median. And now look to the left. A different strategic investor thought the business was worth 33% less than $100 million or $67 million. So you might say, wow, in this particular situation, that business had some investors think it was worth $67 million. A bunch of them thought it was worth 100 and one of them thought it was worth 167 How could that be? These are the most sophisticated investors in the world. The private equity investors have raised billions of dollars. The strategics are generally very successful, large, global private, uh, public companies. How could there be a spread of 100% around the median? It must be an anomaly, right? Actually, not right. Rather than being an anomaly, what we find is that in every single transaction that we at Bigelow work on, again, these are only private companies, and our company's median transaction is right around 100 million, so let me just continue to use that 100 as the median. You look down here, and what do you see? Well, let's be really scientific, squint our eyes. What I see is that I see very frequently strategic investors are at the top, but not always. The other thing I see, strategic investors are very often at the bottom, but not always. And then, of course, in transaction C, what I see is strategic investors are at the top and the bottom. So this disproves a very dearly held old wives' tale, a narrative fallacy that most entrepreneurs hold dear, which is everyone knows that strategic investors will value my company most highly. That is most assuredly false. Sometimes they do, but very frequently they do not. So what I take away from this creating a market is it's only by creating a market of you know a couple of handfuls of offers that you're really able to ascertain what fair market value is for your private business. It's not like going to the, your laptop, pointing your browser, 
and putting in uh, MSFT and knowing what your Microsoft stock is, because Microsoft trades every few seconds. Your business trades maybe once in your lifetime. So you have to create a market to have any confidence about what the value of the business is. What are the kinds of investors that I was just referring to? Those red triangles, the blue boxes, and the gold circles. I'm not going to read this slide to you. Again, I'm going to make all these slides available to anyone who's on this webinar. I would like to see them later. But generally speaking, the thing I'd like you to take from here is that different kinds of investors have different personalities. Therefore, who you choose matters to your legacy and to your economics. You see, when I started in this business 25 plus years ago, it used to be like the golden rule. He or she who had the gold rules, well, that has gone upside down, my friends. Today, what you have, the entrepreneur owner manager, a really successful niche private company, that is what is valuable and scarce. And what the investors have, which is green and folds and has George Washington on it, that is a commodity that you can rent from any one of them. You may not believe me on this, and not many people will talk to you in this way, but I can assure you that my experience and my scar tissue will tell you it's what you have is what's valuable. What they have is a commodity, and therefore you can choose the kind of investor that is the best fit for you to take your business to its next chapter or to make it sustainable forever. Pete, this is, this is Michelle. Do you mind if I interrupt you very quickly? Please do. I had a question, and I, did, I wanted to ask it before you got too much further. Back on slide 14, uh, so the previous slide, I think there were some questions about what the yellow lines would indicate. Well, the yellow lines are um, in, uh, I didn't want to blow our own horn here. The yellow lines were uh, what our clients' expectations were. Okay. So bef before going to market, in every case, we would have developed a mutuality with our client about what the expectation is of their enterprise value. And you can see that uh, in this case, uh, five out of six times we surpassed that. Excellent. Perfect. Thanks, thanks for allowing the inter interruption. No problem. So really good question. This is a very complex slide. I apologize in advance. But again, if you want to stare at the slide sometime, I urge you to do so because even after being in the business for as long as I have, I stare at it all the time. My biggest concern actually is, um, you know, I don't know, once or twice a month, uh, we'll get a call from an entrepreneur owner manager, had one recently, said, Pete, I've just been approached by the strategic investor in my industry that I know is the best one in my industry. I've competed against them for 40 years and uh, they want to acquire my business. I don't. I just want you to help me negotiate that deal. I don't really want to go through and talk to a bunch of others. And my question to him was, Ken, if it's a strategic investor, look at uh, the bar chart A with me here for a second. Is it the one on the far right or is it the one on the far left? You don't know and I can't know. None of us can know until we create a market. Kinds of investors, again, the thing I want to leave with you here is that the big Differences in investors have big personality differences that will affect your quality of life. Strategics are looking at you know, evaluating, will you be a good fit with us? Private equity firms are looking at, do we want to support you going alone? So not every business, not every organization has an opportunity for a capital gain someday, right? I mean, uh, let's take a silly example. If you're a law firm, while law firms merge, there's no big multiple acquisitions of law firms. Why? Well, there's a bunch of reasons. The assets go home every night. It's not thought to be rigorous or repeatable. So does that company have a capital gain opportunity at all? No. Some do. Some maybe maybe do. Maybe they're an industry that will allow it. We have a, a friend who's got a business, very significant, uh, but he has one customer, uh, which is a very large big box retailer. And you know the answer to him in that situation is, no, you probably don't have a capital gain. Maybe, maybe a small probability you do. Why? Because you only have one customer. And there's no new investor who's going to be willing to take on the risk that the customer changes their mind. But most businesses that we see do have an opportunity for a capital gain someday. And someday, I want to urge to me 
is infinite. It could be that you want to have a capital gain in the next year, 10 years, 100 years. I don't know. But what I do know is that if you want to have one someday, we can coach you that there are six things that you can do right now. Number one, you can recognize the simultaneity of the personal transition and your professional transition. This is big. I met with a prospective client the other day in Florida. His name is John. I asked John, John, um, John is uh, maybe uh, 70. He looks like he's about 50. He's in very good shape, brimming with energy, loves his business. The business is in a different part of the country, but he lives in Florida. He works from there sometimes. I said to him, John, um, you're thinking about a transition for the business. Yes, I am. And you're thinking of transitioning out of the business. Yes, I am. What are you going to do if we recapitalize or sell the business? What is John going to spend his time on? He said, you know, I don't know. I said, tell you what, read Chapter 6 in Enterprise Value and call me when you know. <laughs> because uh, change is coming. And if John sold his business to a strategic investor and stayed on, well, he'd have a boss. And in his case, he'd have a boss for the first time in his life. Or if he was going to transition out, well, he wouldn't have a business to go to. His identity, his self-worth, his relationships, the structure of his life, his wealth creation, right now, it's all intricately woven in with the business. So I say this with great affection, but no client of mine, no matter how brilliant they are, has ever anticipated this kind of change well. So it's a worth spending time on in advance. It's challenging work to do. The question is, if you transition out of the business, what are you going to be striving for in the, in the future? What is your purpose then? Number two, strategy. So my answer to this is, one of the, what is the second thing of the six things you can do right now? Is your business's strategy so simple that you can say it, or actually that your customer can say it in one sentence? Because if it's not, you have some work to do. Strategy is one of the principal drivers of enterprise value, right? An example is that uh, there's some um, another old wives' tale or a narrative fallacy that entrepreneurs often hold dear also, which is, you know, if I make widgets, little um, items that I sell for low amounts of uh, a price per unit, wow, I should really diversify and make big pieces of equipment that I sell for millions of dollars a unit because when the market for widgets is down, the market for big pieces of equipment is up, and vice versa, right? So it's very positive to my enterprise value for me to have a diversified business. Hear me on this. Nothing could be further from the truth. Diversification within a business destroys shareholder value. The new investor, if you want to have a capital gain someday, may have a portfolio of investments. But what they want to have is a portfolio of investments, each of which is a pure play in its own business. That's how you put together a very high value, high enterprise value business. Number three, preparation of your management team. A great preoccupation of entrepreneur owner managers as they're thinking about the strategic alternatives for their business is confidentiality. They have a concern about confidentiality on two levels. Confidentiality within the business and confidentiality outside of the business. I admit that confidentiality is a preoccupation of, of all of us who own our businesses. We want to make sure that we're deliberate and thoughtful about making our decisions. And we don't want to yield to outside pressure. But with respect to confidentiality inside the business, I would ask you, let's think about your senior management team. These are people that it's taken you basically all of your career to recruit and retain. And you're probably very close friends with them. Let me ask you three questions. 
Do you think they know who owns the business? Of course they do, right? Do they? Do you think they know what your total, what all of your interests are in the business and outside of the interests? These are people that work with you every day, sometimes for years and years, sometimes decades. Third question: Do you think they know how old you are? Don't be ridiculous, Peter. Right? Of course they do. So the time to bring your management team, your senior management team, into the dialogue about a, a capital gain someday is when you've decided you're going to have a capital gain someday, not when you're about to pull the trigger. If you know, if you can conclude, gee, I think I'm going to have a capital gain someday in my business, we would urge you bring the management team into the conversation right then. If you do, you're respecting them. You're getting their investment intellectual into, the, into your future goals. You're getting them aligned. Oh, oh by the way, you may have to get them economically aligned. You may have to make sure that they have either equity or economic compensation that looks like equity so that their compensation is aligned with what you want to do someday. We have seen many, many times when entrepreneur owner managers, because of the concern about confidentiality, did not bring their management teams into the discussion early enough, and it turned out to be a train wreck later on when a management team felt disrespected, not included, and really unhappy. I have never seen one time that an entrepreneur owner manager brought the management team in and it was a mistake. Number four, what are the six things you can do right now? Number four, assemble an expert advisory team. When? Now. When you decide you want to have a capital gain someday. Think about how difficult it is as a consumer of professional services to really um, differentiate between those providers of, of professional services. I have a tremendous amount of empathy about this. I think that it's so difficult for us as consumers of professional services, whether it's, uh, I don't know, uh, lawyers, doctors, wealth advisors, M&A advisors. And I'm not, I'm not objective, right? I am an M&A advisor. And I see such difference, such a wide range of competency in professional service uh, advisors. I mean, you may be a registered broker-dealer, or you may be licensed to practice in certain states, or you may have a medical license if it's a doctor, but it doesn't mean that they're all the same. In fact, they're not. There's wide variation between their competency. So why wouldn't you start early, before you are ready to pull a trigger on a capital gain, and just start to put together a outside group of expert advisors who you had great chemistry with, who understood what your personal and professional goals are, and who were committed to helping you get there. There's a great deal of research, and I can give you the citations someday if you'd like, on the results of teams who work repeatedly together versus those who don't. There's no downside to putting together an advisory team in advance. If you want to have a capital gain someday, number five, Measurements or metrics. We've got a bunch of them here, but I'm just going to hit two. Number one, how profitable is your profit? That's not a rhetorical play on words. Which do you think is more valuable? A private business that earns 10 million of EBITDA on 100 million of revenue, or a private business that earns 10 million of EBITDA on 50 million of revenue? And of course, the answer is the second one. The business that has 10 million of EBITDA on 50 million of revenue earns 20% on revenue. That tells investors and me that your customers or your clients really value and appreciate what you're selling them. They're willing to pay for it. That's a really valuable business. Another measurement we would want to talk about is what constituencies do you care about? What sort of time frame do you have in mind that your legacy matters to you and to them? What are you trying to achieve with them by performing a capital gain transaction? Lastly, if you want to have a capital gain someday, we would ask you, what time is it? So in this slide, 
if you'll go with me to the right-hand side for a moment, we'd ask, what time is it for the entrepreneur owner manager? What we're asking is, what chapter of your life are you in personally? One of our clients uh, very memorably said to us one day, she said, where is it written that this is a life sentence, that I have to stay in my family's business? Does a capital gain transaction now get you closer to your personal goals? For her, it did. In the middle is what time is it for your company? Is your business plan complete? Are there people that you need to recruit? Are there things that you need to do in the business to optimize the performance of the business? And lastly, on the left, what time is it in your industry? Now, if I ask you, as business owners, what's the most important driver of value for your business? I bet most of you would say, well, Peter, of course, I know it's the performance of my business. And that would be a really good guess, which would not be correct. The most important driver for the enterprise value of the business is whether or not your industry is in or out of favor with institutional investors now. That drives the multiple that they're willing to pay for your business in a recapitalization or a sale. I'm not saying you can time the market. I'm just saying these are three considerations to take into account if you want to have a capital gain someday. So I guess in wrapping up, um, what I want to reiterate to you is the reason why we dedicate our lives to entrepreneur owner managers is we think that they're the most powerful pro-economic and pro-social force in the world. We're hopeful that these sort of high-level concepts and themes that are embedded in enterprise value are immediately useful to entrepreneurs. And we have a lot of other resources which we freely share at Bigelow. I'm showing some of them to you here. Just go on our website. They're all free. They just We ask that if you're going to use them that you give appropriate uh, attribution. Uh, and um, lastly, I would say to you, as I said in the beginning, if any of you is a business owner and wants to speak with other business owners who have been through or thought through these kinds of things, be in touch with me and I will put you in touch with someone who kind of matches your situation. So that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to take uh, questions if there are any. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. That was absolutely wonderful. And we do have, um, we do have a set of questions. And one, uh, I'm going to take you back just a little bit um, uh, to an early question. So we, have, we have a wonderfully mixed kind of group, if you will, on the phone and, or on the, on the call. So in addition to the six items that you just shared with us, for, um, for those folks that are probably a little bit more advanced, what are your thoughts and can you talk a little bit about um, what you would offer Ed, as advice for maybe the newer entrepreneur? In other words, what would you have said to yourself, you know, 33 years ago or something like that? Are there some pieces of advice you might think of for that group too? So uh, is your um, question within the context that you want to have a capital gain someday? Yes, assuming that will a capital gain. I think that um, for private business owners, uh, the vast majority of them are excellent at one of two uh, skill bases. The vast majority of them are excellent sellers, salespeople, and they have a unique ability to get out and sell something of value to their customer or to their uh, client. The second uh, largest share, by the way, would be people who have technical proficiency. They may be technical protégés or they may be technical tinkerers, but for whatever reason they're, they're technical and they have a proficiency there. I think one of the saddest things, Michelle, that I've seen in my career is that um, there has been a, um, a, a widely accepted theory, which I think is wrong, which is that when you are a business owner and you go up that, that arc and you become more successful and your business becomes more mature, that you have to become a manager. And sadly, what I see some entrepreneurs do is that they become more, they have to spend more and more time at something that they're not good at, let's say management, and they spend less and less time of something that they're uniquely capable of selling or the technical side. So one of the uh, 
coaching I would have for an early stage entrepreneur is to find a way to continue to focus on your unique ability, whatever it is, as the business continues to mature and not to get distracted by spending time in general management or things that are not as valuable and take you away from your unique ability. You may have to hire that, and you probably can. There may be people who are uniquely capable at management if it's not you. But I would just urge that the old paradigm where the business owner had to be the chief cook and bottle washer and do everything really uh, detracted from the enterprise value of the business. Yeah, I, I think uh, a follow-on to that, and somebody else made a comment too, is um, maybe having just some clarity around what your strategic intentions are early on. So yes, bringing, bringing the skill sets to the table, but also recognizing that you are looking for uh, you know, a, a capital gain later, and that it's, um, it's certainly within the landscape, and taking, taking your business in a, in a direction that uh, points you appropriately toward that. So would you agree I with think, that statement? Yes, I think that's right. And you also remind me of a conversation I had recently with a, with a client where um, you know, uh, he's struggling with uh, how to have the business sustained beyond him. He's a very young um, guy, but he's at a point where he wants to do something uh, in the next chapter of his career, and he's struggling with wanting to potentially keep the business in the family versus not doing that. And um, I asked him, uh, Kurt, I don't remember, but how, how old were you when you started in the business? And he said 29. I said, how, what was the business worth when you went into the business? He said, well, of course, it was zero. I started the business. Right. So what's the business worth now? Well, uh, you say, Peter, it's, it's worth $150 million. Right. So handing the keys to you at age 29 and having the business be worth zero is vastly, vastly different than handing the keys to your 29-year-old daughter and having the business be worth $150 million and, and wishing her well and saying, please don't mess it up. Right. It puts a very different tension on you. It puts a very different tension on her. And I think it's, it really time worth spending to think through these things, as you just said, early on, and not to feel like it's somehow giving up that you want to put the uh, business in the hands of someone who's going to stand it beyond you. Excellent. Um, another question <clears throat> is uh, phrased, is there a specific industry, niche of business that you work with or focus on? In our practice, um, uh, let me back up a paragraph. It is, yeah, that's a really good question. It's very frequent in, in our industry that some of the competitors focus on different kinds of industries, whether it's uh, aerospace or automotive or technology. We at Bigelow specialize in entrepreneur owner managers only. So we have no public companies, no division of public companies, no businesses that are owned private, by private equity firms. We only work with people who have their own skin in the game, who are trying to build value and capture value. That's our specialty. We do it across a wide range of industries. Why? Because we feel that our clients are the experts in their industries. And of course today, because of our technology, information on those industries is available to absolutely everybody. So we spend our time on exclusively with entrepreneur owner managers across a wide variety of industries and across all geographies. Excellent, excellent. Um, so just some comments. Very, uh, a lot of people saying this is quite thoughtful. Um, and um, well articulated and a lot of appreciation. Um, I'm looking to just, I'm scrolling through to see if there are any additional questions. And it looks like, it looks like um, we've been able to get most of the questions answered. Is there anything else, um, Pete, that you'd like to add that, um, just in kind of summary before we wrap things up? I would just say, Michelle, that um, entrepreneur owner managers, uh, and you would uh, see them in the book Enterprise Value. These are some of my best friends, and I, I, everything I say to them, I say with great affection. They're the most uh, generous, demanding, challenging, demanding, brilliant, demanding people that I know. <laughs> and it's very, very rewarding to work with them. So uh, that's why we're willing to share all this information as widely as we are, so that hopefully it'll be immediately useful and helpful to people who are a little earlier in their stage. Absolutely, and I would echo that sentiment and um, 
in, in a very uh, heartfelt way, demanding yes, but I, you know, you wouldn't have it any other way. The, the best people around, so uh, you got it. Yeah, we're with you in the same sentiment of that. Well, Pete, thank you so very much. This has been an absolutely wonderful webinar, and we appreciate so much your willingness to share the information, share the tools, and give us actually some really smart things to think about uh, as we as we head into a new year, and, and really, frankly, from then on. But uh, thank you so much. We, we appreciate it greatly. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you, Fast Track, and thank you, Kaufman. Absolutely. Everybody, uh, these slides and Pete's webcast will be available on fasttrack.org forward slash authors within the next couple of days they'll be up there. And obviously Pete's book is available um, and, and he, um, I've actually had a chance to read it and I would highly recommend it. So take a look at Enterprise Value and I think you'll be um, uh, thrilled as I was. Everybody have a wonderful week and thank you for joining. Bye all. Bye-bye.